Howdy hackers and welcome to a new episode of Fairlight TV. Today we are updating our gear a bit. Uh, what I'm shooting this with now is a GoPro and a little bit of extra props. This is actually a Fairlight blanket which is available from Red Bubble shop. Uh, so if you want to buy one of those, uh, they are available there. Would be happy to see you buy one. They are super nice, very soft. All right, uh, this episode is going to be about the topic that I've been requested to talk about uh, by one of the viewers of the previous episode. That is level crunching. That topic in itself is sort of big. So I've decided to do like a theory block and a practice block. So the theory block is this one where we talk about the different compression methods and the next one will be about the practical application of compression, how it's used in practice. Uh, if, we, if we talk generally about compression, that means that you are representing a block of data shorter, which is really handy because everybody needs uh, their space on disks and their bandwidth when you, when you transmit something to uh, like include as much data as possible and if you compress it you fit more because it the footprint is turning less uh, there are two first of all um, out of all the technologies you can use to compress the first first distinction you need to do is between the lossy and the lossless Lossless means that the source data and the destination data is the same. So you have something, you compress it, you uncompress it, and those are the same. Lossy is you have data, you compress it, you uncompress it, and you compare, and it's actually not the same. It's been modified in the process of compression so that it can compress more efficiently. Um, if I mention three of the formats, then you probably understand why this happens. So MP3, MPEG and JPEG are three examples for music, uh, moving pictures and still pictures. Uh, they could be modified so that compression becomes more efficient. Uh, so if you take JPEG, it's trying to adjust the picture ever so slightly so that uh, so that the data is structured in a way which the compressor can eat more efficiently very handy and uh, not really practical on the c64 on the c64 we only use lossless because there is no real um, the, the data we are using needs to be uh, depacked 100% the same or the programs would crash or it would look like crap, crap on the screen. So we could never use any lossy compression on the C64. It's just not doable. Uh, yeah, samples and MP3, but let's not go there. Let's just say we use lossless. Uh, the first and sort of plain and basic technology for packing is run length encoding. You, let's take 200 zeros in a row in a file. You reduce them into one parameter byte, the number 200, and then zero. So you're telling the, uh, the dpacker when it's going through the pack data, it reaches the the parameter byte, okay, now I'm going, now I'm not just going to copy the content, now I'm actually going to do something. I will inflate the, the destination data based on the principle or, or the little parameter that the pack data contains. So it will read that, it will read uh, 200 and then zero, and then it would inflate the 200 zeros. So in my example, the 200 bytes is packed down to three bytes, which is super efficient right that that saves a lot of a lot of bytes which means that the end result will become a lot less a lot smaller uh, so uh, and the first pass you normally scan the byte and you count the uh, the frequency of all the bytes in the file and then it picks the parameter bytes being a, a, a byte that uh, is basically not represented in the source or at least represented very few times because 
if you represent one parameter byte, you would need to have something like parameter byte one and then parameter byte again, because that would say, okay, deep pack one byte and it's this byte, which is the parameter byte. So in that scenario, uh, one byte in the destination is three bytes in the source. So you're actually every frequency of the parameter bytes where it's representing itself rather than uh, signaling the fact that here comes something that you should depack, uh, you lose something. So you want a really uncommon byte. And best way to find an uncommon byte is actually counting all of the bytes in the file. So we tended to call these packers. I have no idea why we call them that, but that was the name for them. Uh, and if you talk to somebody on another platform or if you talk to, to somebody in, in uh, in any school uh, studying computer science and you talk about packers, uh, they would probably not know what you were talking about. So you should use run length encoding when talking to somebody actually studying this for real. But, uh, but amongst us in the C64 community, say packer and everybody would know what you mean. Everybody and his brothers sort of did their own. So if you search CSDB or any of the other places where you can have scene related material, you would see that there are many, many packers. They could be named something else, compackers, zippers. Uh, I personally use something called EBC, equal byte compressor. The version I did was, uh, I used was uh, coded by Qued of Triangle, or at least uh, that's the version, uh, the core that he adjusted and, and gave to a number of friends. Uh, and I was lucky to be one of those. So Huffman. Yeah, that's very complex. I have tried to record this a few times and it doesn't end up well, but I will try again. So Huffman represents bytes using a shorter bit combination. And Huffman is beneficial if you have the st st statistical distribution of your bytes in a very narrow band. This is called entropy in the science of this. Uh, so let's say text where basically all the bytes in the entire file is amongst, uh, let's say, 64 typical characters. The rest are unused. This is a scenario where Huffman could do a lot of good because then it can represent the 64 rather short and it doesn't need to bother about the rest because uh, let's say m the 64 first could pack efficiently and then if you have representation of the other it would pack really poorly and if you have lots of representation all over the spectrum Huffman wouldn't do anything good it needs a, sort of a narrow representation so the statistics statistical distribution of a few bytes need to be rather big for it to make any sort of difference Okay, skip Huffman. Uh, that was just a parenthesis. Now we're going into the me really interesting part, and that is LZ77. Uh, there is 78 and, and what have you not. And that is not using bytes as the source of compression. It's using uh, sequences of short length or any length, basically. Uh, so if you have, let's say, uh, a up to M in the alphabet represented multiple times. What the sequence cruncher can then do is have the first one uh, being represented and the second time it's represented it's just say giving a reference to the other occurrence of the sequence saying okay it's this many bytes away from where I am now and the sequence length is this. So you can represent this big chunk into a very, very small thing. And if, if you're making a really, really good cruncher, it can work with rather small sequences and still make a profit on those. Uh, and then you also analyze the file first so that you're only applying the technologies or, or the principle where you actually benefit from them. So you optimize how you represent data. So representation is the smallest possible one. Um, if but the, the the result of this is uh, it looks like a mess because there is byte shifting. Nothing in the source data uh, 
nothing in the destination data is kept within the byte boundaries. So you could have one sequence that starts, every, every byte starts on, on, on the first bit in a byte, but when it's represented in the, in the end result, it could be starting in the middle of the byte and then spanning as it should, and then ending in the middle of another byte. So you can't basically see anything. Everything looks totally scrambled if you look at the end result of, of crunching. Uh, the same is actually true for Huffman, uh, because it's also putting the, de the destination data in, in sort of a byte shift format. Uh, yeah, and what are the typical names of C64 crunchers then? The original one, uh, the first one I ever came across was uh, something called match, uh, um, something called Time Cruncher by Matcham of Network. Uh, Norwegian guy, really talented, came up with this really early. I have no idea if he had any theoretical background or he just realized that this is a way you could do it yourself. But uh, it was really efficient for the time. So time crunch, again, many of those at CSDB. The next thing that had its reign for a very, very long time was cruel crunch. It took forever to crunch. It took hours and hours. Personally, I started it in the evening and then hopefully it was done by the morning. Eight hours was absolutely no strange thing. It could easily take more than eight hours. So ensure that you had a blank disk because you didn't want to do it again, realizing that you tried to save on a disk that was full. Uh, more recent uh, implementation was Dark Squeezer and Byte Boiler and AB Crunch. So Dark Squeezer uh, by Sharks and Byte Boiler and AB Crunch by OneWay. Uh, nowadays everybody's using the PC or, or, or a bigger machine to crunch and now we all use something called Examizer which is an excellent piece of code. So this is all the theory there is. Next time we will talk about how you apply RLE and sequence crunching and also what level crunching is and how you're going to use level crunching if you want to use that. But that is in the next episode and you will only see the next episode if you press subscribe and the little clock icon to ensure that somebody will notify you whenever the next episode is out. So until next time, bye bye.